we are the third week into a sermon series called Management Material, How to Care for All of God's Stuff, um, <laughs> which um, I have been enjoying this nerdy series. Trust me when I tell you that today is no less nerdy. It's probably the most nerdy of all. <laughs> Jesus, help us. Look, Lord Jesus, help us. <laughs> so uh, around here, like in terms of like uh, with the staff, when there's something that is overwhelming that we have no answer for, we just simply say, Lord Jesus, help us. Um, so I hope it's not overwhelmingly nerdy, but just in case it is, just say, Lord Jesus, help us. <laughs> um, we will be um, in Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 through 11 and Mark chapter 2 verses 23 through 28. Um, I want to pray and then we'll jump into it. Father, God, Lord, we don't pray as a pause. We pray um, as a means of living well. It is a part of who we are to seek you in all that we do. It is not obligatory. It is because of this intimate relationship that you desire to have with us and this means that you have given us to interact with you, creator of all creation. You have, you started all of this <laughs> um, and you invite us to prayer. And so as we go into this time in your word, may our hearts be aligned with you, may our minds be renewed by how you shape us in Scripture. May our hearts uh, be also aligned with each other. Bring us onto the same page in your word, God. That's one of the beauties of Scripture is you get to bring us onto the same page. Uh, May everything that I say glorify you and build up this body. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this week is a little bit different. Um, the title, if you will, or subject is Managing My Time God's Way. And if you've been here throughout this sermon series, we've kind of been having managing and then you have to be intentional to put God's in between whatever the thing. So the first week was managing God's money. The second time or second week of the series was managing God's skills, gifts, and um, talents. This one is different. This is the only sermon in this whole series where the thing we're managing, we can't say explicitly belongs to God, which is an interesting thing. But let's talk about it logically. We're going to have a real linear moment right now. God does not care about time. (laughs) It's okay for us. It's like God couldn't give a rip about time. Like... (laughs) This is a being that sits above and is not subject to. My body is subject to time. Okay, I know that because when I was 25, I could do some things that my 38-year-old body does not want to do anymore. The other day, I was walking up the stairs and remembered how I used to, like, I would never walk upstairs. Who walks upstairs? (laughs) I mean, I'm taking two and three steps at a time, bounding up the stairs. And now it's like, okay, here we go. Bless your name, God. You know, you know, okay, listen. Okay, I, <laughs> my grandmother, my grandmother is the one who like, who would show, like would do this all the time. She would be walking and she would just stop. Okay, hallelujah. Cool. To sit down, who glory to your name, God. <laughs> right? You get so old that you gotta praise God just to move around, right? <laughs> like, cause you don't know if any one movement is gonna throw your back out. Okay? Some of us have lived that long. I just had to happen for the first time. Things that you took for granted, and then all of a sudden bending down. All it welds up this praise inside of you. Thank you, Jesus. I got up. <laughs> so, but this is not something that God is subject to. This is that like Creator God doesn't care about time. And in many respects, time isn't real. 
which is a nerdy thing to think about, but it doesn't exist for real. It is something, it's a measurement that was created so that we can track where we are at the same time, in time and space, right? Like the calendar. If you go six months without paying attention to what day it is, you'll forget. (laughs) Because it's not real. (laughs) And it's only there so I can tell you, hey, on Wednesday at 9 a.m., we want to do this thing, and we show up at the same moment, right? That is not the way God works. However, God does oftentimes enter into our reality to relate to us and engage with us. So while God is not subject to time, God cares about time within the context of our need to care about time, right? But there's, so, there's portions of Scripture where it says to, to God, like, a thousand years is a day and a day is a thousand years because it don't really matter. Like. And there is a moment for all of us where that will be true, too. Like, the beauty of what eternity is is that it's nothing and everything all at the same moment. All of time and no time because it just doesn't matter, right? And so when we talk about being with God for eternity, we are really saying that we will exist with Creator God with such complete fullness that it really doesn't matter. We won't have watches to look at and it make a difference. And some of us get to experience that even now. I wanted to say some of us, all of us get to experience that now. Like if you have nowhere to go and you turn on the right music and you forget about time for a moment Mm -hmm. or some of you are artsy and craftsy and you get your hot glue gun out. In the morning, you have your coffee, your hot glue gun, and everything else. And then you blink, and all of a sudden, the sun is down. That was like eternity for a minute. It didn't matter, right? But we have to process time. So... Scripture does talk about time in a way in which we can utilize and steward that in a way that brings glory to the Father. And there's two primary things that we talk about when we talk about time. Work is one of them. Rest is the second. We don't really need many sermons about work. Right? Now, it doesn't mean that we don't have to, you know, encourage one another to work and work ethic. Scripture does have a solid, like, work ethic to it. But at some point, the discipline to work shows up because you want to eat. (laughs) Right? You don't need the Holy Spirit to build in that. (laughs) Listen, because even if you have a sugar daddy... (laughs) Or even if you got somebody paying your bills, at some point that dries up. And you got to (laughs) work. Even if you want to be an influencer, right? Because I know that some of us who are like kind of older millennials and up, we kind of (laughs) disrespect the culture of trying to be an influencer in life. But there's work to that. And I think that's actually really important for those of us who are younger to understand. That's not just something like I I put a camera in front of my face and then all of a sudden I become an influencer and I have all of my videos are monetized. Like every single 30 second video you watch takes hours to produce. It's time and energy and effort and skill work. (laughs) And we don't really need to talk about that in depth. But as Americans who increasingly are workaholics, even after we retire, we still can't sit down. We got to find something else to do. We do need to talk about rest. So we're going to talk about that mostly today. Um, Exodus chapter 20. Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the tablets. No, not iPads. Tablets made of stone. 
carved out by the, f- the finger of God. That's kind of how Numbers describes it. And he gives these ten commandments, and kind of in the middle of all these commandments, God says this. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. <laughs> but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. We start there. Because that's where scripture begins to talk about our relationship to rest. Some of us are like, okay, so does that, like, are we about to have a kind of legalistic moment where we talk about how we can't mow our lawns on Sunday? Nope. Not saying that. That's not where we're going. But I think it is important for us to understand the foundations of scripture's relationship for humanity with rest. And I think the beautiful thing that shows up here is this rhythm. Six days work, one day rest. Like six days to do all the things that you need to take care of. And on one day, rest. And it legit was a command. Like, don't work. (laughs) Don't do it. And I honestly, I can't say that I'm not going to pretend to understand the motivation of God. But I do know that we've had enough what we've seen in Jewish history to understand that working every day was all they knew. That was what they knew. But I think there was another element to that that is true throughout Scripture that we see. Rest is more than just taking a break. Sabbath is more than just taking a nap that day. Sabbath is about trusting God. At the end of the day, Sabbath isn't just for you to take a break. It's to inspire and motivate this trust in you that would say, I have to grind. I got to hustle. I got to keep it going. I got to keep it going because I depend on me. And if I don't do it, then we won't eat. And that day, when you choose to not rest, you are, or when you choose to not work, you're saying, I trust you with this day. I feel like I need to hustle because I keep checking this bank account. Right, that's just the truth. Some of us have our bank apps and we like, it's almost like going to social media, like our thumbs just know what to do. (laughs) We type the password in, we look, okay, we're good. We type the password in, we look, we're not good. Hustle, 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 hustle. That's not all of our stories, but some of us, that's true. And Sabbath is a moment where you declare, open the app, look at the bank account. We're not good. I really, really want to go do somebody's lawn or do something for somebody real quick so I can make sure I get this. And I'm just going to trust you with it, God. I'm going to turn it off real quick. And I'm going to sit here. And trust that you have me. Because here's another truth. God's never been a bulldog. Will not grab onto you and make you do anything that you do not want to do. So when God says, I got that day, you could rest. If you choose not to, you got it then. You are trading what God intends to provide with what you can provide on that day. And just like mm -hmm, you're trading what God can provide for what you can provide on that day. That's the real point of Sabbath. Yes, it's a command. Yes, there's a law that was connected to it. But there are no commandments and no laws that don't have any that aren't connected to our relationship with God. So it's more than just I don't want you to, to work that day. There's something deep happening 
something deep happening to transform who I am on that day. And that's what God wants me to pay attention to. And for people like the children of Israel who did not know how to rest, they needed something as serious as a command. But we have a lot in common with them. We may not be recently emancipated from slavery, but that does not mean that we have not been made a slave of the system of how we function here. Many of us don't know how to rest. Even when we're on vacation, we're checking emails. Sorry, I hurt your feelings. It's not that we don't want to. We don't know how to. And it's part of it is because we haven't allowed ourselves the opportunity to see what it is the Lord will do during that rest. So for them, it was that intense that God wanted to make that point that he made it a law. But because humans are extreme, <laughs> we take everything to the, like, you know, as, as extreme as we can get it. So we make it super legalistic, and it's like, you can't do anything. Like, you can't even walk more than 90 feet. That was a legitimate, like, that was something that the Pharisees added to this law. It's like, what exactly is work? Mm, walking more than 90 feet. How did they get that? Like, was it that it broke a sweat? Like, <laughs> If walking 90 feet breaks a sweat, then we got a whole nother conversation we need to have. And it has nothing to do with work. I'm like, listen, it's okay. If walking 90 feet like causes us to like question whether or not, mm, will the father discipline us for walking that far? There's a lot of different things that we've got going on inside of us. One of them is that is a lack of trust in God. Right? And another one is too much of a dependence on my ability to define things. <laughs> and, that, and so they added so much. So that's why we have to go to Mark. At this point, Jesus is here kicking it with his disciples. And we show up on, in Mark chapter 2, verse 23. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, Remembering all of what we just talked about, what Sabbath is, right? Don't do nothing. Don't work. They added some things to it, right? His disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. <laughs> but the Pharisees said to Jesus, look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? <laughs> Rachel shakes her head. Like <laughs> Jesus said to them, haven't you ever read, read in scriptures that David what David did when he and his companions were hungry. He went into the house of God during the days when Abathar was high priest and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. He also gave some to his companions. So let's stop real quick for a moment of commentary about what's happening. So Jesus' disciples walking along, they're hungry, they pick some grain. Which for those of us who are not in an agricultural society, that doesn't really seem like a lot to us. Right? Like, that's, so it's like walking through the grocery store and grabbing a grape. <laughs> right? It's like, uh, and there's some things about that could, that could make us uncomfortable. Right? Some of us do that. Like we grab a grape and we eat it. And, and some of us are, that's not our jam. We, that, that's not our vibe. Okay? Christine and I were actually talking about this the other day. Like, uh, particularly as a black person, like, uh, walking through the grocery store, I ain't taking nothing that's going to give you any reason to think I'm taking anything. <laughs> so, no, I'm not eating no grapes. <laughs> I'm not opening this bag of chips in here. <laughs> right? But I've seen people do it. Right? I've seen people do it. It would come with some similar tensions there. Right? Specifically because it's the Sabbath, not because it's grain that's growing in someone else's yard. It's specifically because it's the Sabbath and they're being accused of wrongdoing in that process. Jesus says, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Y'all Pharisees, you know the Bible in and out. 
Let me remind you of this story. David, the one that you really like, <laughs> the king you really like, he broke the law too. When he and his companions were hungry, they broke the law. So, what are you coming at us for? <laughs> right? That's really what Jesus is saying. He continues, then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. There's tension baked into this whole process. There's tension all the way through what Sabbath is. For those of us who don't know how to rest, there's tension. And for those of us who are legalistic about resting, there's tension. <laughs> because some of us can't even imagine doing what is normal and healthy during a moment where we have this legalistic view of what resting is. And so the point of today is to honor how God has spoken about time as it relates to work and rest. And I learned a lot about bread baking um, recently. So I, break, I baked some bread. <laughs> um, so if you can see this picture. Um, there, I'll actually show you the, the picture of this bread here in a little bit. But can you go to the, yes, bread. I'm like Oprah Winfrey. I love bread. <laughs> I eat bread every day. <laughs> Some of you remember that commercial. I don't even remember what she was advertising, but that part right there was just as, that was just as true as scripture to me. I love bread. Like, okay. <laughs> I eat bread every day. I've learned a lot about bread um, just in the last few uh, last week, honestly, and particularly some of what happens when bread is being baked. And for those of us who don't, break, don't bake bread, we don't understand this process of what's going on. The closest we get is smelling it at, you know, when, when you're entering into a bakery. And it smells great, okay? Uh, but there's a lot of nerdy science that we won't go too deep into, but theological benefit. So when we start off talking about bread, let's talk specifically about gluten. I know some of us are gluten-free, but we have to talk about gluten. And a part of actually why many of us are gluten-free is not because our bodies actually have an intolerance to gluten. Our bodies do, however, have an intolerance to how bread is made now. And ultimately, it's because we try to make bread so quickly. So what we buy in the grocery store is designed to be quick. It's designed to rise quickly, bake quickly, and get out. And it doesn't allow for the opportunity for those gluten strands that are in there to appropriately settle. And so we ingest that, and that causes challenges with our digestion. However, old school bread that's allowed to rise slowly, those gluten strands get an opportunity to chill. They, it's, not, it's not a fast process. You can look up the nerdy science of this. I'm just giving you layman's terms, right? When bread ferments slowly, the gluten strands are not stressed, and then when we die, it makes it easier for us to digest. So things like Ezekiel bread is still made with wheat. It's not like it's, there's no gluten in it, but it's made in such a different way that it allows those gluten strands that are in there to be able to be more easily digested. But most of us don't know that because we just go to the grocery store, we get a loaf of bread and we make a sandwich and then we upset <laughs> when our stomachs are upset, right? So we're talking a little bit about that when we talk about what work and rest is because you can go to the next picture. If you ever have baked bread, you know that you need to put all of these ingredients together. The basics of bread are flour and water and salt and yeast. Anything else that we add is just because we like flavors. But that's the basics. Flour, water, salt, yeast. 
Those elements, you can go ahead to the next picture, those elements are needed for us to be able to actually get, get good bread. Let's talk about yeast. We know what yeast is for, right? Yeast is for leavening. It's rise. It causes there to be actually gases. I won't go nerdy to you. I won't go too nerdy with that. But those of you kids, Google what yeast does. Be amazed. <laughs> it's alive. It's a bacteria, and it's alive, and it's eating the sugars, and the salt that's in there slows down that process. It's necessary to have salt in bread for two reasons. One, slows down the yeast so that the yeast doesn't eat through all the sugars to the point where the bread no longer has any nutrient value. But then also, the salt is what enhances the flavor of the wheat that's in there. And also, salt is what gives you this yummy, crusty business. If you bake bread without salt, it will be pale. Once you have all those things together, you have to work it. You have to knead it. Those of us who've baked bread before, we get in there and you're like, <laughs> like you're pulling it. You, you know, uh, my, my family, um, since I've married into the Johnson family, um, they have made these rolls. My Lord. <laughs> my God. I told you I love bread. I knew the first Thanksgiving I was going to marry Christine. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, they know how to make bread. Glory to your name, King Jesus. We're good. All the other things can, we'll, we'll figure it out. No. <laughs> right? But there's a kneading process, right? You can't just mix it all together and throw it in the oven. You've got to make. And so what's happening while you're kneading bread has to still do with those gluten strands. Right? You are causing stress on the gluten strands so that they combine all of the ingredients together. And so one thing that you know, if you've made homemade bread before, and I would encourage you to do it, just play around with it. The more you knead it, the tighter the dough gets. Right? And that's important. You actually do want it to get tight. What's tightening are those gluten strands that started off loose. Now they've been stressed and they're a little bit more constricted. And the more you knead it, the smoother everything gets, but also the tighter those strands get. And then what do you need to do? Go to the next picture for me. You got to let it rest. You have to let it rest. If you need, 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 because I'm in a hurry, and then you just throw it in the oven, you are baking bricks. Yeah, that's right. That's right. They will smell great and be used for nothing but keeping paper from flying in the wind. It will be tough. Listen, some of, some of us are tough. Come on. Okay, we I'm not going to have these little these pieces of these loaves of bread up here and not talk about what this means for us. Some of us do a lot of work and we're tough. We're wound up. We're tight. And we can't receive anything from anyone nor can we give anything to anyone. And if you can't receive anything from anyone who you can see, then you definitely can't receive anything from someone you can't. And perhaps why things are so difficult for us to hear from and receive from God is because we got all this kneading going and it's smooth, but the dough is tight and I've been baked and now I'm just a brick. Rest is necessary. Rest is necessary for our souls, for our minds, for our emotions, for our bodies, for our relationships. Rest is necessary. Most, those of you who are children, most of your growing happens when you sleep. The growth hormone that kicks on that allows you to grow, that is most active when you're sleeping. 
That's why when you're having a growth spurt, you're more tired than you normally would be. Because your body is trying to grow bones. And even when you're teenagers, I, tell, I told our, our teenagers when they were younger and they hated naps, there will be a day when you are going to come home from school and you will, you will like, you'll probably get a snack and then crash for like three hours. And my two teenagers, that is true. <laughs> Every day. Like, and, like, and it's because their brain is growing. It's changing. Something's happening physically that is requiring rest. And if we do not allow for that rest, then we have challenges. Some of us have, y'all know what it feels like when you've been exhausted? I just got to live that. I told you last week I was exhausted. It had been more than two weeks since I had a real day off. Some things that show up for me when I'm tired. For a person who speaks all the time, like it is my job to talk and to write and to find words. And when I'm exhausted, I struggle finding the simplest words. Right? That's kind of the beginning for me. Right? I'm, I can be having a conversation, and I, and I just cannot find the word. But it's a word that I use every day. So why can't I find it? Too much kneading is tight. Rest allows for me to be at the best that I am. What happens after I can't find the words is I'm a little snappy. Christine knows. By 9.30, and some of you have been with me after 9.30, by 9.30, my filter is gone, and I find myself just like, just don't say nothing, Chase. Just don't, don't say nothing. Don't say a word, because it, I know as soon as I say something, it's not because I'm mean, it's just because I have zero filter. I have, my brain cannot in any way process, how can I communicate in a way that they will receive it well? I'm going to just say it. <laughs> I need rest. We have not been adequately taught in our culture to stop during those moments. We actually justify them. So I can't find my words, so let me get me some coffee. I'm a little bit snappy, but they shouldn't have been doing what they were doing anyway, so whatever. Not acknowledging that you actually need to just go turn your lights off and take a nap. Rest is important. What's happening with the yeast in that moment is it's introducing gas into the dough, and the gluten is relaxing. The truth is, you can bake bread like this bread had two moments of resting. The first was about two hours. Then I did a little bit more working. And then the second was an hour and a half. But for those of us who have gluten intolerance or uh, sensitivity, the truth is you could actually let, the, let it rest even longer and it would be more nutritious for you. For all of us, it would be, but particularly for those of us who have a sensitivity to it. And what I mean by that is like putting it in the refrigerator overnight. That gluten gets to just be and relax. But then by the time it's baked and, it's become, and you ingest it for nutrition, your body isn't working so hard to unravel that gluten, Right? So, some of us need to rest so that the next individual that we come in contact with doesn't have to work so hard to unravel. And some of us, you only have five, ten minutes in the morning <clears throat> or in the day for devotions, <clears throat> but it's going to take you nine minutes to just unravel. So that means you got a minute to hear from the Holy Spirit. Whew. Rest allows for us to be available. Go ahead to the next picture for me. 
So this is actually these loaves as dough. We have to talk about scoring. Scoring is when you make those cuts in the bread. It's not just because it looks good when it's done. Even though it does look nice, that's not the primary point. That scoring is for when you're baking a loaf of bread, all those gases that the yeast made have to, they expand and they will go somewhere if you don't give it somewhere to go. Generally speaking, it will go in making bubbles in your bread. And so if you've ever gotten pizza from uh, a restaurant and it's got this weird bubble on, at the top where the crust is, it's because it wasn't scored. So the gas that was in the yeast made a bubble there. And basically it just makes your bread look like trash. Right? <laughs> it tastes good, but it doesn't look good. Right? Scoring gives those gases a place to go so that your bread is not deformed. Scoring <laughs> gives the gases a place to go so it's not deformed. Scoring gives the gases a place to go so it's not deformed. Many of us struggle with that idea of experiencing any pain, so we avoid it. <clears throat> and a part of why we won't rest is because we know that when the pain we ha when we rest, the memory of the pain that we have experienced will come flooding. That has been my life. I'm just being honest. Before I had a regular rhythm of rest, I avoided resting. I worked. Because I knew that as soon as I slowed down, the pain that I experienced in my childhood, the pain that I was experiencing in my relationships, I would have to look at. And when I looked at them, I would not enjoy the process. And so I would go do some work. But if we don't actually allow that process to happen, we end up deformed in the process. We end up with things growing off the side of us that aren't supposed to be there, spiritually and emotionally. And it is in that process of acknowledging the pain and resting that we get to experience really healing and purpose comes out of that. If it doesn't happen, then we miss an opportunity for God to actually do some healing in us. When I first started uh, kind of having a regular rhythm, I, had only, I could only do three hours at a time. Three hours of no work at a time. That's all I could actually stomach. I wanted to be able to say I could do more, but I couldn't. I really couldn't. It was too painful. I would slow down, and as soon as I would slow down, I would become very anxious because I would start to actually get flooded with memories. So <clears throat> um, it's, this is not new. If you're newer here, um, you might not know this, but it's not new. I, in my childhood, experienced some sexual assault. And I didn't remember most of it until I was about 25. And it was at 25, is, like 24, 25 is when I started wrestling with resting. <laughs> and I was in my kitchen, not working, and whew, it all just kind of flooded at once. And I needed a counselor very quickly. And before then, I was afraid to slow down. And even in that time, it was incredibly painful. But continuing that season of resting and allowing for those moments of rest to be times where I'm hanging out with a counselor and processing what's going on, healing has come that would not be there otherwise. And I look back and I can see all of the anxieties that I had before that season of being able to walk through some of the healing 
I look back and I can see symptoms of depression that are no longer a part of my life. And a part of that has, yes, I'll give all glory to God. But a part of giving God glory is acknowledging that he has established a rhythm for humanity. Rest. And that may mean that when you rest, you have to actually look at some things that are painful. Do it. So that the gases have somewhere to go and you don't end up deformed. Right? If we're going to be people that represent God well, then we have to manage our time in a way that God has instructed and encouraged. Yes, work, family, work. I'm not saying rest six days and work one. If, look, if that's your vibe and you can pull that off, teach us. <laughs> teach us your ways because I will gladly invert that equation. <laughs> But if we can't do that, at a bare minimum, we can work, rest, work, rest, work, rest. This last picture, because you guys can't see it all clearly, I asked Christine to take some pictures of the bread for me because she's way better <laughs> at taking pictures than I am. Um, and that's, that's the finished product. Here's what I want us to to take a look, to me, excuse me, to challenge ourselves with. Go right to that next slide for me. Oh, ha, before we get to a challenge, there's a really good book by a woman named Kendall Vanderslice, which I have to say is kind of the funniest kind of, <laughs> like, <laughs> name, given the fact that she's a baker. <laughs> and she has this theological way of, processing bread. And so those of us who like need some way of engaging with our devotional time that involves our bodies and our other senses, this is a really good book, right? She's not paying me to advertise for her, but it, I have the book now. And there's some great devotional material in there that allows you to also see, even talk about why scripture talks so much about bread. Just about every single book of the Bible has bread in it. Why would Jesus connect his body and bread, right? There's some really great things in there about that. So it's a good, it's a good, it's a good read. It's a good book. Um, that's where I got that information about scoring. I was like mind blown. Like what? <laughs> All right. The challenge. Um, every time we have a management material challenge, my challenge to you is to make time for nothing. And some of us are, we kind of like, oh, like, when I, when I don't, when I have nothing going on, then I'll rest. That will not happen. You live in the United States of America. We always have something going on. And when we don't have something going on, we put something there. That is who we are as Americans. But as people who are citizens first of the kingdom of God, doing nothing is valuable. Doing nothing is valuable. It says something about my faith when I do nothing and I allow God to do it. Make time for doing nothing. Put it in your calendar if you have to. Just, and I just like put nothing in capital letters. <laughs> and hold yourself to it. For those of you who this is not a normal practice, when you get there, you immediately spend five minutes doing nothing and then you need to fill some time. And I want to challenge you, push yourself a little bit. Push yourself a little bit. Don't scroll. That's something. Don't clear your emails. That's something. Don't plan out your meal prep. That's something. Don't catch up with your kids or your neighbors or your siblings or your parents. That's something. What I mean by nothing is in the next day when you look back, you will be able to say, I achieved nothing. I'm not saying just sit there silently because some of us will literally go mad. <clears throat> but I'm just saying it, there's, no, it's no, there's no consequence to it. There's no benefit 
to doing it other than it allows you to rest. Uh, I told you last week I was exhausted and I was having a hard time finding words. And I spent Monday about 10 straight hours playing Zelda. Listen, I got pretty far. <laughs> Listen, I love it. And I woke up Tuesday and I had my mind back. That's just, it's nothing of importance. And it allows my mind, my body, my soul to just be. And then I get to wake up the next morning. Whew, okay, I'm back. Find the unsung blessing of empty spaces. That, those words are from, my, uh, from a mentor of mine um, who also wrote a really good book um, uh, called Addicted to Hurry. Um, Kirk Byron Jones is his name. The book is Addicted to Hurry. And he was talking to me about the unsung blessing of empty spaces because he recognized in your boy that I have a proclivity to working hard. Like, I just like doing things. <laughs> and he was like, Chase, I need you to find the unsung blessing of empty spaces. When you have an empty space, do not fill it, Chase. When you have an empty space, receive it as a provision of the Lord for you. And take that moment to trust him. Which was harder for me than I could probably, than I wanted to admit before. But in that moment, say, God, I thank you that I don't have a whole bunch to do right now. And I'm just going to relish in this for a moment. For those of you who would have the anxiety of all the things falling apart, there is a mystery, just like when we talk about giving, right? We talk about sharing and giving our money. There's a mystery to the fact that we can't outgive God. There's a mystery to the fact that you can't outwork him either. <laughs> so if you're going to trust God with your finances, you can trust him with your rest too. And the same God that makes sure that you stay afloat financially will make sure that nothing, none of the plates that you've got spinning fall. And the last thing is, this is a kind of a three-part challenge. If you can't stick around in the nothing long enough, try to figure out why. Spend some time processing that. I know what it was for me. And for those of you who are most convicted right now and struggling with what this is, try to spend a little bit of time figuring out why. Coaches, mentors, counselors, people with the gift of discernment and exhortation, right? They can kind of help you see, yeah. Oh, I, know, I can see why you're having a hard time figuring out why, because for some reason you have, this would be the reason for me. If you're not successfully achieving anything, then you think the people around you won't love you and will leave you. So I'm not trusting God, and I'm not trusting y'all. But in rest, I declare my trust of God and my trust of the strength of our relationship. That means that I don't have to be achieving anything in the next five minutes for you to still love me. Right? And everyone has something that we have to kind of take a look at. Trust me when I tell you it will bless you. Last thing, which is similar to everything else, seek the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Management material, seek the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. The reason why Jesus was like telling them like, hey, you can't, don't be checking, me, checking us on getting grain. is because, look, they're hungry. They've been working. We ain't going to just go hungry all day because you ain't supposed to work. Eat. <laughs> Seek the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. If it's a time where you're supposed to be resting, but something cold shows up that's an emergency, well, don't just say, let the emergency just be. I'm resting right now. Seek the wisdom of the Holy Spirit because the same God that will keep everything floating while you're resting will also allow for you to rest when you need to take care of something. It's about having this 
It's about having this culture of managing my time the way that God has instructed. And then the wisdom of the Holy Spirit allows me to be a little bit more um, free in how that fluctuates. All right. I want to pray and then we can uh, let y'all go rest. Lord, thank you. (laughs) Thank you, God, for um, uh, for how you encourage us with time. You encourage us to work and to be about yielding great fruit for your kingdom and for your glory. And we are grateful that you have invited us to that work with skills and talents and abilities and purpose. And Lord, you also invite us to the mystery of how just doing nothing still brings you glory. And in that nothing, you do some work in us that you cannot do while we're working. So God, give us grace to trust you more in that. And give us grace to step little by little into that discipline that you have encouraged. Yes, it is for our benefit and it's for our good, yes. But ultimately, Lord, um, it is affirming our trust of you and our siblings and those around us. It's for our, it's for your glory, God. So give us grace to live in it well. Lord, where we are struggling with this, Holy Spirit, you have this way of challenging and encouraging us at the same time. We receive the challenge. We also embrace your encouragement in it. Give us grace to trust you more, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.